early January and the sun popped out today, so we decided to run back through the woods and kind of do a year in review of our little front woods here. We did a video a couple years ago touching on some topics of things we've done up in this area, but we just wanted to talk about what we've been doing and then kind of some plans for the future in here. Um, this is the central part of the woods. It's a little clover patch that we just keep throwing clover seed in and mowing a couple times a year, pretty low maintenance. As you can tell, the area around this is super thick. This is like the primary bedding around here. It's up on this knoll where you can see the fields around in the winter and it's like a lot of thick, dense cover. This clover patch is about the only open area in this woods. So we're gonna hop over to here where we planted some oak trees a couple years ago, kind of look through and see how those are doing and scout around, see if deer have been using the area. So we're coming into this area where we basically clear cut all the dead ash trees out of it. It's a little thicker than it was a couple years ago. A lot of blackberry, black raspberry coming in. And of course, multiple rows and a lot of other brushy species are popping in. We got tree tubes on the trees we planted. Actually, this one's up out of the tube, which is pretty cool. Most of them haven't popped up out of the tube yet. They have, what, we planted three years ago? Two, two years, two years ago. ago. We planted these, so let's hop in and see what they look like. I think this one was a pin oak. Yeah, that one's doing pretty well. The deer, <laughs> like even right there, the deer love the buds of these oaks. It's uh, pretty important you protect the buds from deer because obviously the ones that got up out of the tube are still getting nipped. The goal here is to try to keep most of the buds protected so that the tree can keep sprouting and growing up out of this tube. It'll be several years before we pull these off. These tubes have been complete junk, honestly. <laughs> our stakes were not worth a crap either. Um, these things have folded over. A lot of our stakes were too short. Doing it over again, we'd have higher stakes, sturdier tubes. And honestly, we'll look at some other examples, but doing it over again, I'd probably just plant more trees in that brush where a deer's not gonna go in and browse and just let the tree grow up through. As you can see, the natural regeneration is a little hickory, but it's just popping up through where a deer doesn't have any need to go in and browse. When we've cleared around these tree shutters, we've almost made a nice little environment for a deer to walk up and munch on. <laughs> so there's a lot of, obviously, ash popping up in here where we cut all the ash trees out. Some of them are stump sprouts of the trees that we cut. Other ones are just seedlings that are popping in. We're gonna let everything just continue to grow in here. Eventually canopy will be what keeps a lot of this briar, pet, you know, blackberry and those briars down. I think I was looking at this one earlier. The deer have completely munched the top of this tree off. Um, I think it came and like grew up through the tube. I don't know what animal's been going at the sides of these tubes, but some of them have just got like shredded by raccoon is my best guess. I've heard people say that they go after like wasp nests inside of there and they're going after honey more or less. And we've had a couple of these tubes just completely shredded. We blamed it on the neighbor's dogs, but we blame about everything on the neighbor's dogs. Okay. That's a good example of how a lot of the tree tubes have ended up. Obviously we came in with these crappy little bamboo sticks later and added some, but the tree's still growing, just like I said, the trees that are out in the open like this, I think, stand a lot more chance of getting browse. I mean, all the rest of the browse is getting hit more here. Over here, there's an oak that just popped in naturally. I don't know, probably grown like three feet in the past two years. It was just a little sapling when we planted all the rest of these, and now this thing's nice and big. Now this thing was already established. Like I said, we didn't plant it at the same time, but it, it had a bunch of brush growing around it. Deer weren't really browsing it, and then we came in and kind of cleared around it now that it's bigger. But it seems like wherever a seedling is kind of just in that brush, in the blackberry and stuff, like deer aren't just gonna walk in there to randomly browse it. Looking back on this whole thing, I would have just like made it pretty inaccessible for the most part and just slapped all of our trees randomly in there, taking the money we spent on tubes and just thrown twice as many trees in there. Um, we got what we got now. I think the trees that are surviving as of now are gonna continue to survive. Some of them are doing pretty well up and out of the tubes in a couple years and that's this is probably one of the sturdiest ones we have 
But pretty happy with the success so far. We had what pin oak, bur oak, and swamp white oak that we planted. Most of the ones up on the upland here did really well. There's a few down in the lower area that got flooded out, but for the most part, pretty excited. I mean, we spent a decent amount of money on them and probably 70% survival at this point. Yeah. So we're standing underneath these big apple trees. I'm, when our parents moved in here, I think it was just these apple trees and then like maybe a couple trees in the back that were actually standing and everything else has just grown up around it. So all these guys have got to be at least, I don't know, 50 years old, if not older. They absolutely dump fruit out every year. There's a couple that are about this size. Down here, there's some <laughs> like 30 foot tall ones. And if you can imagine in the, in about August, these things are about loaded to the ground with fruit. Obviously deer love coming in here and bedding because of that. But the size of this bedding area, I think kind of limits how many deer can actually be in here at one time. Um, Usually we'll have a doe group that's hanging out up front and then either one if, or two small bucks for most of the year. And then during the rut, right. get some bigger deer moving in. But for the most part, it's just an area to hold one to two doe groups and we're about a hundred yards from the house. So that's the goal. I'm gonna hop up into this area now that I did some hinge cutting three years ago on. I want to talk about successes and failures in that and then how we're going to manage it moving forward. This is a pretty good example of how deer have been browsing these stump sprouts. This is two ash stumps that we had cut two years ago. Yeah, two years ago. And the right side is the ones that haven't been browsed. The left side is the ones that have been browsed. You can see each of these tips is nipped. As deer walk down this trail where the, you know, there's tracks in the mud, you can see where they walk. They're browsing whatever's closest to the trail. The sprouts back here that didn't get browsed are probably 10 feet tall now. <laughs> there's some other trees right here that are cherry trees that are sprouting. Same time frame, cut a couple of years ago. We're gonna hop up into this area where I cut some silver maples that sprout even crazier. And I'm gonna kind of talk about why I don't like the sprouting up in that area. But here it's fine. These ash trees are going to continue to live until they die from the borer again. But at least now they feed some deer as they walk along this trail. So like this is the main trail that comes up and into this bedding area. There's about 10 feet of elevation between where Keith's standing and then the top of this hinge cut bedding area. The main trail that runs along the transition is like to the right is a bunch of blackberry, to the left is a pretty wide open understory. So come on up and in and we'll scout some of these beds now. So this, this stand's kind of weird because when we were kids we could stand here and it was about chest high goldenrod. We'd paintball in this field and you can see the house plain as day. And over time succession has moved along. We've got silver maple, ash, and then just a couple cherries. And that's mostly what's grown up and in. And the past 10 years, we've kind of got like a closed canopy now and pretty much just a grass understory that's about six inches tall. Not ideal for deer bedding. So I came in probably, I think it was three years ago, I came in and hinge cut and then just completely flush cut a bunch of these silver maples down. Look at how much these things have sprouted over time. This is like three years of growth on this silver maple. Um, they're incredibly fast growing trees and then when you cut them from the base, they're gonna sprout back and grow even faster. Looking back on this now, I would have probably just not even done this at all. Um, what I did was basically just made a bunch of structure that is now sort of rotted in three years and kind of gone. Instead, I came in the summer and did something a little different. I wanted to open up some sunlight to the ground and kill this sprouting you know closed canopy yet again wanted to come in and kill it standing so i went in with a basil bark herbicide using like a triclopyr solution killed all the silver maples in this patch it's not really easy to tell right now but in the summer you come in and there's a lot of sunlight hitting the ground there's all kinds of different stuff growing up in there there's like pokeweed some goldenrod starting to pop up back in a lot of the grass and just herbaceous growth is a lot more advanced in there where there was sunlight hidden in the ground in the summer versus here where it was pretty much closed canopy still. Nonetheless, the deer are still bedding in this spot. You still got some thicker stuff to your right, a little bit of structure at eye level, and then a lot of th thick stuff that way to escape into. The deer have always bedded here our entire lives. I mean, it's 
the train makes it the best spot to lay. You can see two different houses and you can see the main trail right there. We're just trying to basically sweeten the pot, get a little more browse in here for the daytime. Back in the day, it was nothing to see a buck bedding in this spot. It's, it's a great spot to pick off does. It's a great spot to pick off people before they get to you. Right up to my left is the trail over here where you can jump out on that and escape if you're a deer. And then you can also just watch everything throughout the day. It's always been the best spot. It's just a tricky spot to get into and hunt. But going forward in here, I'm gonna to try to continue to kill off the silver maple, just set succession back. Years in the future, once a lot of these oak trees have advanced, I'd like to maintain this area with fire and keep the succession a lot younger. Since our parents moved in here, this was basically all goldenrod, just old field, old pasture. That was early 90s? Yes, that was 30 20, years ago. 30 years ago. Now we're 30 years later, there's actual forest starting again. We just want to set that back and get it back to the awesome habitat and start shooting ra 10 rabbits a day like we used to. <laughs> Thick stuff to the left, thick stuff to the right. Here's the main trail that cuts through between this bedding area and the clover plot out in front. So we're walking down the main trail now that goes to our clover plot. Everything to our left is the area that I'm hoping to burn this spring. There's a lot of good native brush in there, like black raspberry, blackberry. There's some other like dogwood and um, viburnums too. Some goldenrod up in this area. But basically what we're gonna try to do is, yet again, set back succession. The problem in this stand is we've got a lot of invasive species moving in. There's honeysuckle, privet, autumn olive, multiflora rose. There's a variety of different things that are growing in there now that are woody and competitive and stuff that frankly wasn't there before. We're going to try to keep it as native in the understory as we can and try to use fire as the technique to do that. The past few years I've been in here spraying early in the spring and doing cut stump, tre cut stump treatments on honeysuckle for the most part. Um, but if you look out over through this understory, there's just a lot of low shrubbery. You can keep blasting with herbicide, but I want to just try fire. It'd be a lot cheaper and probably a lot safer to use in the future. The goal in here would be to hopefully not hurt any of the bigger trees. Not too worried about these, but we're going to mainly focus on burning leaves down in this area where it's kind of a actual woods. So now I'm standing in our clover plot. Like I said, in the summer, this is a good open area that is surrounded by brush. Great spot for rabbits to run out into, deer to run into. Everything has to come through this spot if they're coming through the woods. It's the highest point in the woods and it's open and you can just hop in, see about 40 yards and then hop back into the brush. Everything to the left here still would be in this burn area that we're trying to, trying to tackle. A lot of good black raspberry and blackberry and patches like this and then just a lot of gnarly vine stuff. My hope is that we can burn that off, get a lot more of that herbaceous and grassy growth coming back in. I might even throw some native grass seed in there too. There's patches where we cut a lot of ash trees out, where there's going to be a lot more sunlight hitting the ground. And rather than rows just continuing to take over like it always does, I want to try to see if we can get some other better stuff growing in there. So this is the woods that we would be trying to burn. I think as we jump into here, there's a lot more. There's a huge track right there. Yeah, decent size. Uh, resident six point. Um, as you get into here, the leaf litter gets a lot more hickory, um, a lot more conducive for burning. I think this area will for sure burn. I don't think it's going to go fast or kill any trees, which is not the intention. But at least just to clear the leaf litter off would be the goal. So especially in here, you've got a lot of small seedlings that are mostly ash, some poison ivy. Um, all in all, there's just not a lot of productivity in the understory. The goal in here would be to burn the leaf litter off, kind of restart what's there, and then come through next winter, maybe even during the growing season, and do a crop tree release on a lot of these bigger hickory, cherry, and oak. I'm hoping that when we give that blast of sunlight to the ground, we've set it back to as native as we can get it. 
and try to get stuff like blackberry, um, a lot of different forbs, probably stuff that we don't even have here now popping in when we give sunlight to the ground. You can hear it crunch though. I and mean, honestly, we could probably burn it on a day like today. My goal would be to probably wait until mid-April, early April, when rose, privet, and honeysuckle are all leafing out and try to get a fire going through then. So hopefully it gets a better kill. If we did it now, I think everything would top kill, but it would still sprout back. I want to hit it just at that time when the invasives are green and all the native stuff is still dormant, much like you would do with herbicide. I'm standing on one of the ash stumps that we cut out of this woods. We cut most of this back in the winter, yeah, roughly a year ago. There, this wasn't a full ash canopy. We're kind of picking and choosing them in here. And now we've sort of opened up the canopy in spots that we didn't really intend to. Out in front of me, there's a decent little opening with some blackberry and stuff growing in it. But what dad and I decided to do was we came in around March, we spray painted a bunch of these trees with numbers. This one in front of me, the black oak old number 13 what the goal that one's probably like i don't know 13 inch diameter right now we came in with a diameter tape measured right where those numbers are roughly you know four and a half feet off the ground and we're going to just watch that every year every five years and just try to get a sense of how fast all these different trees are growing we did oak cherry walnut and i think some hickories too we're going to try to just track the the growth rate of different trees some of them I'm going to use as a control, some I'm going to do crop tree release on and just see if we get a response that we're looking for. Trees are growing pretty fast in here. If you think about all this woods was basically just goldenrod and saplings when I was born. So 27 years ago, this looked a lot different and a tree like that's pretty much 27 years old. So stuff's growing pretty fast in here. We just want to get a sense by putting numbers on it and tracking it over time, how fast and you know what we can actually expect in the future as far as tree growth. This is one of the nicest stands of walnut we've got. Like I said, everything in here is about 27 years old, 20, 25 to 30 years old, and nice straight tall walnuts. This section in general has the best form of all the walnuts in our property. So we're gonna try to manage this as a, you know, an actual timbered stand. Probably not gonna use fire in here to try to not hurt those walnuts. We're gonna eventually come in here and do what I said, do some crop tree release and try to speed the growth up of some of these walnuts. In general though, they're, they're growing pretty darn fast compared to some of the other areas too. There's a tree down there, number 12, that's about 12, 14 inches diameter. This one here is about 8 inch diameter. Other than walnut, there's just some cherries and some sugar maple and a couple hickories mixed in. But for the most part, we're going to keep this as like a walnut stand. It's going to be open, which is nice because right above us, it's super thick. And then there's crop fields out around. It kind of makes a nice hard transition. And then over there, who knows what that's going to look like after we start messing with it. So now I'm hopping out of this open walnut maple stand and jumping up into this thick ridge. Way out there you can see the huge oak tree, obviously the biggest tree in our property. Pretty much anywhere you stand in this seven acre woodlot you can see that tree. Also, if you're up in that tree, you can pretty much shoot anything in this woods around you. Right up here, there's a, this little bit of a high ridge. And the deer tend to bed along that. There's about three to five foot tall rows and all kinds of crap growing there with down trees. It's a perfect spot to bed and see all the woods and fields around you. I was in here earlier today and I'm pretty sure I kicked deer out. There's beds along that ridge line. The stand is kind of interesting because there's always been little oak trees in here but now some of these are they're black oak and now some of these are starting to get the size that they should drop acorns i haven't really seen sign of them and if they're at, they, if they are dropping at this point they're not they're not putting off a lot of fruit now we're back in the thicket that i was just talking about where this high ridge drops off into the neighbors to the left there's this real gnarly vine jungle that I came in about five or six years ago. A bunch of trees were bent over from grapevine damage and I just went and felled them all the way. Knocked them over, let the vines kind of consume the whole area. But the goal in here is to continue leaving that as like a vine arbor. Good spot for deer to bed and look out over that field right over my shoulder. Along the edge though there's some 
nice young oaks and the goal is to just go around every couple of years make sure the vines are staying out of those nice trees and actually this this white oak up on the edge is pretty interesting because it was, i remember that tree leaving that one and it had very little canopy and now it's starting to all, like completely grow out into that gap cut the vines out of it and i don't think there's any in it at this point but basically just trying to stay up on top of the vines and make sure the the jungle doesn't just continue to come up into our woods here just kind of keep it localized in that one spot give it another 10 to 20 years and those oak trees should be pretty good size like the ones up above us so to the right is this we're going to call it the grapevine arbor the grapevine jungle the mess whatever you want to call it there's a lot of trees that i just completely knocked knocked down and let the vines consume everything to the right we're trying to keep is that vine jungle everything to the left we're going to try to maintain as woods you can see pretty well through there there's a couple vines just i mean they're tearing every tree down um, phenomenal rabbit habitat I'd say you pretty much can guarantee you're going to jump a rabbit out of somewhere in here the deer like to bed up in this too and then in summer there's a lot of browse where all those vines are all those vine tips are at eye level and then rows and whatever else is growing in here we haven't done really any management other than just keeping the vines out of the woods in here but we're trying to keep that like transition on our property i think if it gets too gnarly and this goes all the way up to the edge of the property which is 20 yards to my left and that might just put the main travel right on the neighbors right here. As it stands now though, we're standing on the deer trail that kind of cuts along the thick edge here and then the open woods to the left of the neighbors. So our vine jungle makes a nice edge for deer to sort of relate to. There's a lot of bedding that goes on just on the edge of this and then just above it as well. But right down here, you can actually lay, and look out over the whole neighbor's field pick somebody off if they're coming at you that direction. There's a little pretty fresh pile of deer scat right in front of me. It's not exactly the, you know, the most ideal browse in the winter, but it's something that they can get up, you know, pick around on different browse here, hop into the neighbor's field, hop up into our clover plot. There's a lot of food right around here and we're just making a gnarly thick area for deer to lay. Wherever we've made thickets like this, we've been very careful to make sure that we keep access going through it for deer. So basically what I've done is just taken loppers and gone through and chainsaw in a couple cases and gone through and just busted trails through and the deer maintain them. They keep weaving through and browsing what they need to to keep it accessible for themselves I think also. Um, this area right here to my right, not penetrable. <laughs> I mean you if you wanted to run through there it would take you a long time and you'd never get through quietly. I think deer like being right up against that gnarly stuff. But when they're moving through it, they're gonna pick those easier trails to weave through or like the trail that we're on that runs right around the edge of it. I can see a couple beds in here. I don't think we've ever actually found a shed in here. I've always thought this would be a cool spot to find a shed. It's south facing, field right in front of you. And you know, it's a pretty good location. It sits back on this point where you can probably wind anybody with a northwest wind as soon as they pop out of our house. I'd like to know where the actual, the exact bed is because I came in here a few years ago and I cut in an area and like actually brought a shovel out and shoveled a little level spot. I mean, there ain't much of a hill that like, you can tell there's like maybe 10 feet of elevation, but there are certain spots where it's a lot easier and more comfortable to lay. I think where I made that bed's up there to the left, so I'm kind of curious to see if it's being used. But up in front of us, there's a pretty nice road. Oh yeah definitely not like late season by any means looks like it was made pretty early in the season like I was saying all the trees in here are just were growing like this before I cut them and they're just still growing like this makes for some pretty crazy structure a lot of horizontal structure in here a lot of vertical structure it's just very difficult to see through this and it's January you come in here in September October you can see like five feet it's probably why the deer like being in this spot this is one of the spots where I leveled out the ground. And it looks like a deer did lay here, nothing recent, but the, the travel is kind of blowing my mind. Like there was a very minor trail here. This is one of those spots that I came in and took a chainsaw and cut and made a defined trail going out to where behind where Keith is. Now it splits into two. There's one going that way, one going this way. Everything on that side is just ridiculously thick. We found a dead buck laying somewhere up in front of us here last year. Seems like pretty often you can jump 
a buck somewhere in this area if he's in this wood lot. It's just on the edge of like being in some gnarly stuff where they can dip out and be in the neighbors in no time, but close enough that they can still keep tab on all the on all the does up in the front. Right here is one of the more predictable scrapes on the farm. We've got two giant apple trees, and then in the growing season, or like in October, these create a lot of shade and actually keep the ground pretty open around here. If deer are bedding off the sides of this, they like to come through here and tear the ground up. <laughs> There's a fresh tracks in that from the past couple days, it seems. That scrape is getting hit daily, multiple times a day, I'd say. This would be like an example of a bedding scrape in our property. I've seen bucks bed 10 yards off and just walk right over here and hit this. Same thing they would do in that clover plot. Hit a little opening where they can see some stuff, scratch the ground, browse them some stuff, go lay back down. They're still in their bedding area. And that clover plot is right there anyway, so. So we're gonna hop up here, hit a trail, and go out to the new, the new yard, check that out, and then show you another spot and wrap it up for the day. this one yeah I'd say that'll be a scrape right there with the trail going in now you have the new yard two years ago this was just the regular old yard grass we did a lot of things to it the biggest thing I think was we burned it off last spring basically just burned the grass you know cool season grass dead thatch burned that off threw some different seed in and a lot of what's coming in is native natural a lot of it's just introduced. We just threw wildflower seed in. The past couple years I've been collecting seed just from friends' properties and things and throwing a lot of that seed in. It's taken a lot, while for a lot of stuff to establish, but there's black-eyed Susan, coneflower, a variety of different things. We could probably make a whole video on that at some point, but we're just trying to keep this area as just early successional wildflower pollinator habitat. Mom thinks it's all for the birds and everything, but I'd like to shoot a rabbit out of it someday too. It's pretty cool. We cut some trails through it, we'll walk it, and then kind of round out the round out the walk. So we're just gonna maintain these trails with the mower. I mean, we used to just mow this whole patch, and now we're just mowing 10% of it, 5% of it. The deer clearly walk down it. It's kind of tough to tell, but in the summer, a lot of this stuff is chest high. I mean, the wildflowers, the goldenrod and everything is about chest high. There's some grasses that are starting to take off in there too. The plan is to burn at least this section, maybe this section, but definitely this section and the one over there. We've got it all parceled off by these trails too. We're going to try to keep it on different burn rotations just to keep some diversity in there. Thanks for watching. That wraps up our little small property walkthrough. This patch of woods is about seven acres and we've done quite a bit within there. The main goal is to just keep a couple doe groups bedding in there, the bucks coming in there in the rut, and then help, hopefully it all relates to different thickets around. The goal is really just to make this the best bedding on the block. It's gonna try to keep it as native as we can, keep it as early successional as we can, keep it from being a dead-ass jungle like everybody else's woods is ending up. The yard is just a sweetener. Um, this was a spot that was just clover and small cool season grasses, and now it's a hunting ground for Lewis. Something else exciting that's happening this year is we're doing putting one of our fields in CRP. We're going to make a whole different video and follow along that. We got uh, shrubs we're planting, we're putting warm season grasses in, and uh, hopefully in a couple years, that's all looking like this.